Pericardiocentesis During Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation by Dr. Tracy Woolbrink. Introduction Pericardiocentesis is performed in patients with cardiac tamponade in order to restore cardiac output. In this video, we will be demonstrating the blind technique that is used when a patient has an emergent need for pericardiocentesis, such as when a patient is receiving active cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It should be noted, however, that whenever possible, this procedure should be performed by a specially trained healthcare professional under ultrasound or fluoroscopic guidance. Indications and contraindications. Patients with cardiac tamponade have accumulation of either fluid, blood, and or air in the pericardial sac, causing increased pressure, limiting the ability of the heart to fill, thus decreasing cardiac output. Signs of cardiac tamponade may include tachycardia, narrow pulse pressure, hypotension, pulses paradoxus, jugular venous distension, decreased heart sounds, enlarged cardiac silhouette on chest x-ray, pericardial effusion on echocardiogram, and low voltage QRS or electrical alternans on EKG. Patients may present clinically with dyspnea, tachypnea, tachycardia, poor perfusion, and or change in mental status, including agitation, and thus a high degree of clinical suspicion is required to make the diagnosis. Patients at risk for pericardial tamponade include those that have had recent cardiac surgery, trauma or injury, cancer, renal disease, infection, or autoimmune or inflammatory disorders. Cardiac tamponade is one of the H's and T's that healthcare providers should remember when providing cardiopulmonary resuscitation on a patient who has pulseless electrical activity. There are no absolute contraindications to emergency pericardiocentesis. The following equipment is needed for emergent pericardiocentesis. Appropriate personal protective equipment, including sterile gloves. Emergency resuscitation medications and equipment. Cardiac monitoring devices. Antiseptic skin cleanser, such as chlorhexidine. A large needle or spinal needle with a trocar removed. A 20 or 21 gauge needle would be acceptable for a child, and an 18 or 19 gauge needle would be acceptable for an adult. Syringes. It is helpful to have both a small, 5 to 10 milliliter syringe and a large 20, 30, or 60 milliliter syringe. Slip tip syringes are preferred, but lure lock syringes would also be acceptable. A three way stopcock with T connector. If the effusion is of large volume, then the T connector can be attached to the spinal needle and the three way stopcock to the T connector. When the syringe is full, the stopcock can be turned off to the patient to allow emptying of the syringe into a container without having to disconnect the syringe repeatedly. Alternatively, the syringe can be disconnected from the T-connector, emptied, and then reattached. Both of these techniques reduce the risk of accidentally dislodging the needle from the pericardial space while manipulating the syringe. And both are most easily accomplished with the second provider manipulating the syringe while the first provider stabilizes the needle. Positioning and Landmarks during active cardiopulmonary resuscitation, the patient will be in supine position. The xiphoid process should be palpated in a sub-xiphoid approach, which is between the xiphoid process and the left inferior costal margin, will be the most optimal approach to use when a patient is actively receiving CPR. Procedure Start by cleansing the skin. During active cardiopulmonary resuscitation, the patient will not require local anesthesia, but this should be considered for elective or semi-urgent procedures. Connect the syringe to the needle gently so that it may be easily removed without disrupting needle position. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation should be briefly paused during the advancement of needle and aspiration of syringe. Insert the spinal needle in the sub-xiphoid region between the xiphoid process and the left inferior costal margin. Angle the needle underneath the rib cage no more than 45 degrees to the patient's skin and aim the needle towards the patient's left shoulder as you continuously aspirate the syringe. Short, quick jabs, as opposed to slowly advancing the needle, are required in order to penetrate the parietal pericardium and to not tent it against the visceral pericardium. Advance and aspirate the needle until fluid, blood, and or air is obtained. The distance from the skin to the pericardium is based on body habitus. 
If no fluid is obtained, withdraw the needle to just underneath the skin and angle the needle more posteriorly, closer to a 45 degree angle, and re-advance the needle while continuously aspirating. Remove and flush the needle after several failed passes. If ultrasound is available, confirm the needle is in the pericardial space and not in the heart with an apical four-chamber view. Secure the needle at the skin with your other hand to make sure the needle does not move unnecessarily during the procedure. Change to a larger syringe and continue removing fluid. Remove the needle when you can no longer aspirate fluid and remember to resume cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Complications. Complications include cardiac arrhythmias, pneumothorax, accidental puncture of the heart or coronary vessels, or injury to the stomach, liver, diaphragm, or other internal structures or organs. Post-procedure monitoring and documentation. Continue cardiopulmonary resuscitation and monitor for any change in hemodynamics. An echocardiogram should be obtained as soon as possible following the procedure if return of spontaneous circulation is achieved. Remember to document the amount and quality of pericardial fluid removed and to send fluid samples for analysis, including cell count, protein, and culture, as indicated. This concludes the video on pericardiocentesis during cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.